An egglock is just like a randomizer, but instead of all the wild encounters being randomized, the first Pokemon you catch on each route is replaced by an egg from a viewer that could be anything they choose. On top of that, I'm using hardcore Nuzlocke rules to make things a lot more challenging, where any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever, no items from the bag are allowed in battle, set mode is mandatory, and I'm not allowed to overlevel past the next gym leader. And so my adventure began over on Twitch.tv. Like the proud owner of a hen house, I was looking to collect some eggs from my chicken, I mean viewers. The first of whom being fellow creator Andrew Collette, who replaces our starter with a smoochum. Not like this. Smoochum's what's generally referred to as a bad Pokemon. Pair that with the pretty much useless hydration ability and Andrew had definitely thrown me under the bus here. So I put my faith in my second egg sent to me by Brian, which happened to be an Azuril. But not just any Azuril, you see this one has its optimal ability huge power and on top of that, Brian bred it to have both Aqua Jet and Belly Drum. This could be a great Pokemon to have, but in its current state, it's pretty much useless, so I set my sights for the wild area. And as soon as I stepped foot in there, my Route 2 egg hatches that I received from Self Spectre, which is unsurprisingly a horsey. Once again, we get a Pokemon that's pretty bad until it evolves, but at least we could use Sniper for some cool strats in the future, if it even survives that long, that is. <laughs> At this stage, I was in desperate need of some good party members. Preferably, my viewers would hook me up with anything that's strong against grass types, and Larvitar is definitely not that. While Larvitar is one of my favorite Pokemon of all time, that timid nature and the unfortunate hidden ability are very bad. There's also the big issue of us not being able to get any more encounters before we take on Hop. Before we take him on, however, we can do a few important things like picking up the leftovers and evolving Azuril into Meryl. But none of that is going to be very effective against Hop, since the reason I'm afraid of this guy is because I picked Score Bunny, giving him Grookey. He does start out with a Wulu first, which I can easily take care of with a couple of bites. He then sends in Grookey, and taking a quick look at my team, I unfortunately only have one option to go with. And swapping into Smoochum immediately backfires as Grookey gets a critical hit, but Andrew does have an Ormberry to get back to exactly half health. This puts me in an awkward spot where I kind of have to sacrifice Smoochum here, but for some reason he goes for Growl instead of Branch Poke. Sometimes the Pokemon AI is a mystifying creature. But in this case, it does allow me to set up a Wish so that when I swap out into Sylph, who gets hit hard by a Branch Poke, I can get all the way back to full health. The following turn, it also throws by going for Taunt, which allows me to get off a free Dragon Pulse for about a third of damage. This is fantastic, since we know a Branch Poke isn't going to take Horsey under half. As long as the Grookey doesn't get a crit somewhere, we know that a couple of Dragon Pulses are enough to take it out, meaning we can get out of this tight spot. Realizing he's been defeated, Hop just goes for Scratch and lets me take out the Grookey with another Dragon Pulse. And since his final Pokemon is a Rookity, we can freely just swap in Larvitar and take the win. Now, I didn't just bring up this fight because it almost went very very, very poorly. It was more to demonstrate that we have a very big weakness to grass, which happens to be the type of the next gym. So once again, at the mercy of my viewers, I went to Route 3 to hatch my next encounter. And I'll tell you, I was very excited to receive a Turtonator. Not only is this thing the perfect counter for the first gym, but it's also got explosive poop. <laughs> Now before we go take on the first gym, we have our first encounter with Bead. And this has to be the first time in world history that anyone has said these words in this order, but I think I just swept this man with Smoochum. With a team full of special attackers and only not very effective moves, he wasn't very well set up to handle a calm-minding Smoochum. Which confirms my theory that the only thing more pathetic than Smoochum is in fact Bead. Arriving at Route 4, we get to add the final member to our team. And one important rule about my Egglock is that once I have six Pokemon, I don't get to hatch more eggs until one of my Pokemon faints. I did this so that I'd have to use every single Pokemon that I hatch, and Shinx is a pretty awesome sixth team member for the time being. One final thing we can do before taking on Milo is evolving Brian into Azumarill. And with all those preparations out of the way, it's finally time to take on the first gym leader. And the first gym of any Pokemon game usually isn't that big a challenge, especially not when you have the perfect counter like Turtonator resisting grass by four times. As you can imagine, this gym was a piece of cake for Tommy the Turtonator. And I'm really glad that I got to experience this little power trip here because the future is not quite as kind to me. But for now, we claim our very first gym. Gym badge. But not only that, Cory the Shanks, who uh, unfortunately has the inferior rivalry ability instead of Intimidate, leveled up during the fight, which means he evolves into a Luxio. Now, Luxio is a really cool Pokemon that everyone likes, so since I have to go up against Nessa, I bet you expect me to use Luxio, but nope. 
Why would I ever need to use Luxio when I got someone as perfect as Tommy the Turtonator? And being a fire type, this choice might seem very strange to you, but the dragon type at least makes it so that we don't take super effective damage from water moves. And since Turtonator's an absolute tank, it's pretty easy to set up three iron defenses getting to plus six using protect every other turn to get as much leftovers recovery as possible. The trouble with using Luxio here is that it doesn't get any good moves to set up with, and I'm not exactly gonna one-shot a Dynamax Dreadnought using something like Spark. So while strategizing for this gym fight, I realized that my team doesn't match up particularly well, and since nothing is able to set up its attack to be able to one-shot everything, we need something to defend. And in this case, that something, or rather that someone, is gonna have to be Tommy. As you can see, with plus six defense, a max strike is doing absolutely nothing. The truth is that this Dreadnought does have Water Gun, but I'm not exactly fearing a max geyser off of Water Gun's base power and its measly 48 special attack. The final turn of Dynamax, Nessa actually does go for the max geyser, but since I use Protect, it barely does any damage whatsoever. From there, Dreadnought's Dynamax turns are over, but since it set up the rain with Max Geyser, Water Gun's actually doing a bit of damage. Luckily, it does less than half even in the rain, though, and we can take it down into the red with a Dragon Pulse. Finally, the next turn, another Dragon Pulse is enough to take out the Dreadnought, granting us the second Gym Badge. Moving on to the creatively named Galar Mine number two, we make our way to what's usually one of the more difficult gym leaders in all of Pokemon, Kabu. The reason I say usually is because in most of my challenges, I don't have a team full of water and rock types. In this case, however, I do have a Zoomerill who's equipped with a Lumberry to be able to get rid of that burn from the Will-O-Wisp so that I can freely set up a Belly Drum getting to plus six. Combine that with the priority stab super effective Aqua Jet and you've successfully defeated Kabu. Getting to sweep through Kabu like this was very cathartic. However, it led to some disastrous consequences since my chat decided to make a new rule. A rule that would set the run on a very different course. But before I can tell you about that big change we made, we head over to Hammerlock. Yo, why does this look like all my college Zoom classes did? And the guy lecturing isn't even wearing any pants. Which was probably the same in my college Zoom classes, huh? The new level cap of 36 lets us upgrade the team quite a bit, evolving Horsey into Seedra, Luxio into Luxray, Smoochum into one of humanity's greatest mistakes, and Larvitar into Pupitar. It's at this stage that Chat and I made a simple but destructive change to the rule set. From here on going forward, if I manage to defeat a gym without losing a Pokemon, Chat gets to vote someone off the team. Yeah, this wasn't one of my brighter ideas, guys. And so, the first gym leader to truly invoke fear within me was Alistair. Since regardless if I defeat this gym in spectacular fashion or not, I'm still gonna be losing Pokemon. So realizing that this might be the last battle I get to have such a fabulous team, I was gonna go all out. And the only great threat on Alistair's team is his Gigantamax Gengar, which packs a mean punch, and we don't have a great answer to it on the team. And so I came up with a genius, albeit very lengthy plan that involved me stalling out most of the attacking moves of this Yamask. Once I had successfully stalled it out of hexes, however, I felt confident to send in Stetter the Pupitar. At this point, Yamask can only hit me with Brutal Swing, and as you can see, it's really not doing any damage at all, and to mitigate that further, I set up an Iron Defense, which I mostly do to bait the Disable, which is gonna allow me to freely set up Dragon Dances. This is why I wanted to stall the Yamask out of Hex to not take any substantial damage as I set up my Dragon Dances, and from there, it was game over. Everything on Alistair's team fell to crunch, even the Mimikyu wasn't too tricky to deal with with our boosted defense, and heading into the first vote to boot a Pokemon from the team, you guys instilled me with some false hope for the future. It's not been easy to do all this training, to build this team up, and have to say goodbye. This is what the poll is looking like so far. Okay? Jinx clearly is the loser. We've had Jinx with us since the beginning. It was my first Pokemon. My starter, if you will. We can reminisce on the good moments. And from now on, things are still gonna be good because we're booting Jinx, let's go! Chat had shown me their loyalty and it was time to hatch the next Pokemon. Unfortunately, however, it was a duplicate Jinx, so we had to move on to the next one. 
Jester had sent me an Eevee, and after careful consideration of what the team needed, Chat and I decided to evolve it into an Espeon. Arriving in Balanlea, I can also pick up the Eevee Alight, which is just about the only useful thing we can get there. Oh yeah, there's also a gym badge we can get. The thing about Balanlea Gym in a run where you get mixed types is that this gym is incredibly easy as long as you don't run a full team of Pokemon that are weak to Fairy. It straight up just gives you power boosts as long as you answer the questions right, so this one was pretty much a freebie and also a free Pokemon to vote off the team for my dear viewers. And this time around, I was a lot less happy with their choice. Unfortunately, Brian, been booted off the team, and I hope to see you in the next life. Goodbye, dear friend. What could it be? Porygon. Porygon is an interesting replacement, less power, but more overall bulk. However, we actually do have a fair amount of power with the analytic ability and a nature to lower speed and boost special attack to make it even more effective. On top of that, we even have access to an upgrade in the Isle of Armor. Enlisting the help of Mr. Spectre, I managed to evolve my Porygon, but realizing that I couldn't see it on my own screen, I quickly asked Sylph if he could try and record the moment, and he managed to get this blurry footage on his phone. So thank you, Mr. Spectre. Once Sylph sent me back Aaron the Porygon, Gun too, we had to go up against Melanie. And honestly, Melanie was kind of a joke because I had Luxray, and she even had mostly female Pokemon, even though Luxray has rivalry in his male. Regardless, one Fire Fang was always going to take out the Frost Moth, and a superpower was enough to take out the Darmanitan. From there, Ice Q only has special moves to hit me with, so it was a free setup with Calm Mind once again. This made it incredibly easy to one shot the Ice Q and eventually the Lapras after stalling out its Dynamax turns. At this point, it became crystal clear that Chad was trying to work against me, and it wounded me in ways I'll never recover from as they took Tommy away from me. But with that, it's once again egg hatching time, and I hatch another Larvitar. And as awesome as it would be to have two Tyranitars on the team, Dupes Claws is still in effect, so I hatch the next one, which hatches into a Cottony. And with the Prankster ability and all the support moves that this thing can get, it's a pretty awesome addition to the team, especially since we just get a free Sunstone in the wild area, allowing us to evolve it right away into Whimsicott. Then, after picking up some fresh new threads and a water bike, I find myself a scope lens, so I figure it's time to do something about this Seedra, and I head on over to the wild area where I can pick up a dragon scale. After another round of trading with Mr. Spectre, Sylph now evolves into Kingdra, and with everything we could possibly do out of the way, it's time to take on the seventh gym leader, Piers. He leads with a Scrafty, so I go ahead and send in Ryan, who's got the incredibly favorable quad effective fairy matchup. So after getting flinched by a fake out and then healing up a bit of health with leftovers, I hit it with a Moon Blast, which obviously takes out the Scrafty. He then sends in his Malamar, and I probably should have just stayed in here and taken the Psycho Cut since it most likely wouldn't have taken me out, but I go ahead and swap out into Eren. The Malamar then hits me with a pretty strong foul play as I go for a recover, gaining all my health back. The next turn, I figure I have enough health to do a bit of damage, so after I get hit by a foul play, I go for an analytic boosted tri attack, which does about 75%. The next turn, I take the chance to recover again, getting back to full health. And the next turn, I use another tri attack, which is going to be enough to take out the Malamar. This means I'm going to have to deal with Obstagoon, and expecting this thing to go for Obstruct right away, I just use Recover to get back to full health again, which seems to be what Porygon 2 does. I then get hit by a Throat Chop, which does about 25%, as a Discharge manages to paralyze the Obstagoon. I'm not exactly sure why I continue to go for Discharge here, when tri attack would clearly do more damage. Either way, after firing off the second Discharge, I decide to swap out into Pupitar, who gets hit by a Throat chop fairly hard and then recovers up a bit with leftovers. I then just figure an earthquake is going to be enough to take out the Obstagoon, but it clearly isn't, and Counter very much punishes me, but doesn't quite take out Pupitar. Having learned my lesson, I immediately swap out into Sylph, who can at least get the KO with a Dragon Pulse. This only leaves Pierce's final Pokemon Skun Tank. Right out the gate, I decide to boost my attack and speed with a Dragon Dance as the Skun Tank tries to hit me with a Screech, but misses. It then actually hits pretty hard with a Sucker Punch, taking me down to 6 64 HP as a waterfall takes it down below half. And then I messed everything up. You see, the next turn I get hit by a Sucker Punch again, but instead of going for Dragon Pulse, I hit it with Waterfall, and because of that Sucker Punch, the aftermath is enough to take out Sylph. 
being live on stream and in the heat of battle, I completely forgot about Aftermath, and to make things worse, I even had Sylph in the call. Little bit awkward to have that die right in front of him, but at least this means chat doesn't get to vote a Pokemon off the team, which I am very grateful for. Even if it has to come at the steep price of my awesome Kingdra. But this just means it is once again hatching time and I got myself a coughing. Honestly, a pretty cool Pokemon, especially with its hidden ability, which means that when it evolves into Galarian Weezing, it's gonna have the Misty Surge ability. But as awesome as it is, Galarian Weezing probably isn't gonna be that useful versus Raihan. He leads with his signature Gigalith and Flygon, so I send in Ryan and Jester. I immediately go for Protect with Espeon to not get hit by any attacks and follow that up with a Charm against Flygon to have its attack. Flygon then strikes back with a weakened Steel Wing that doesn't do too much, and Gigalith sets up the Stealth Rocks. This is absolutely perfect, since Ryan can now use Encore on the Gigalith, meaning it's locked into Stealth Rock and effectively neutralized for the rest of the fight. I also taught Espeon Charm, getting Flygon to minus four as it hits me with another Steel Wing. Next, I set up Cotton Guard to get to plus three defense with Ryan, just to take hits a little bit better, since we're in it for the long game on this one. I get Flygon down to minus six, but all in futility, since it gets a critical hit, taking out the Espeon. This was a pretty devastating blow, but at this stage, at least we had Flygon at minus six, and we can re-encore Gigalith anytime we need to. So I opt to move on to phase two of the plan, albeit a little bit prematurely. I do make kind of a misplay here, since I probably should have just gone for Encore on Flygon, locking it into Crunch, instead of setting up to plus six. Locking it into Crunch would at least block it from using Breaking Swipe, which keeps lowering my attack as I try to get it back up again with Dragon Dance. Since the Gigalith's Encore expired, I do have to use the next turn to Encore it again so that it keeps using Stealth Rock, and I then go for a Dragon Dance, but I thought the Flygon would go for another Breaking Swipe, but it just goes for a Steel Wing, which is absolutely perfect. By Encoring Flygon into Steel Wing, we've initiated Phase 3. In Phase 3, we can set up Dragon Dances as much as we want without fear of getting hurt or having our attack lowered by Breaking Swipe. All I have to do is make sure I keep track of the Encore turns, which the game conveniently does for me. Then, as soon as I've set myself with enough attack boosts, I go for Protect with Ryan and go for Brick Break with Stetter, taking out the Gigalith. This sends in Raihan's Sandaconda, and since I can't protect this turn, I just go ahead and use Charm to lower its attack. I then aim for the Sandaconda with a Brick Break, but I don't end up getting the KO I was expecting. This is bad for multiple reasons. I'm now out of Encores and getting hit by Breaking Swipe, having my attack lowered, and I get hit by Glare from Sandaconda, paralyzing Stetter. I go for Charm again since I don't have any attacking moves, and since Stetter has all those speed boosts, I'm still faster and manage to connect with a Brick Break, taking out the Sandaconda. This means it's time for Ryan's Big Bad Skyscraper Duraludon. And immediately since Ryan has priority with Prankster, I go for Charm to have the Duraludon's attack. Stetter then outspeeds and doesn't get paralyzed, taking Duraludon pretty low with a Brick Break. Flygon once again connects with a Breaking Swipe, lowering Stetter's attack further. I'm then hit by a Max Steel Spike, but since Ryan is at plus six and the Duraludon is at minus two attack, it's really not that big a deal. After another charm, Stetter just barely doesn't take out the Duraludon because of the previous Breaking Swipe. Flygon then annoyingly gets a defense boost with its Steel Wing, and another Max Steel Spike barely does any damage to Stetter this time. Using a third and final charm to get the Duraludon down to minus six, Stetter once again outspeeds and doesn't get paralyzed a single time, taking out the Duraludon once and for all. And now that Duraludon's out of the way, all I have to do is swap Ryan out for Eren, who I taught Icy Wind, which is of course an easy KO, meaning we claimed our eighth gym badge. And since we lost Espeon earlier in the fight, at least that means chat doesn't get to vote off a Pokemon from the team. And since we now have all the gym badges, chat doesn't get to do that anymore. And even though I was pretty excited about this, the game found good ways to punish me anyway. But before any of that goodness, we at least get to hatch ourselves a new team member, and who else but the amazing Pharaoh Seed. Back in Gen 5, Ferrothorn was like the best Pokemon in the game, so I was pretty excited to add Lancer to the team. And the new team setup was gonna be put to the test right away versus the Champions Cup, our first opponent being Marnie. She leads out with a Lipard that doesn't have anything but dark moves, so I took the opportunity right away to send in Ryan, who gets tormented, to take it out instantly with a Moonblast. Starting out with Whimsicott is also a great way to bait out her Toxicroak, which is of course gonna go for a Venoshock to deal super effective damage, so I swap into Stetter who can take it in stride. Knowing that this Toxicroak has given me tons of trouble in the past with Swagger, I give Stetter a Lumberry to heal off the confusion and get a free plus two attack. 
but even without that plus two attack, it would have been a one shot with Earthquake. Stetter being a rock type, it's of course gonna bait Marnie's fighting type Scrafty. Because of this, I go ahead and swap out into Whimsicott right into a Swagger, but expecting this outcome, I did equip Whimsicott with a Lumberry, healing off the confusion, meaning that we can take out this Scrafty with a quad effective Moonblast the next turn. This sends in Marnie's silly little Morpeko, but since it's her final Pokemon before her Gigantamax Grimmsnarl, we do kinda have to do something in the form of setup up to not get utterly destroyed. Unfortunately, getting paralyzed by Spark on the Switch doesn't exactly help my plan. The plan, you ask? Well, it's really quite basic. I'm just gonna try and go for Curse, setting up as much defense and attack as possible as the more Peko takes itself out with Iron Barbs. Not exactly the most streamlined plan, especially while paralyzed, but it does net us a free win with Gyro Ball. This leads us to our second Champion Cup opponent, Hop, who was really such a piece of cake that he's not even worth mentioning. And I only say that because I'm embarrassed to admit I had some big trouble with my next opponent, Bead. Now, Bead is fundamentally an object of ridicule on this channel and most other places on the internet. The guy's got an old lady's hairstyle, he dresses like cotton candy, and he's the most annoying guy in Sword and Shield. On top of all those things, I even had a foolproof strategy to deal with this guy. Well, I say foolproof, but it mostly just involved me using Curse to boost my attack and then taking out all his Pokemon with Gyro Ball. And the truth of the matter is that while I was live, I didn't think about the fact that his Hatterini had Mystical Fire at all. And for that very reason, my team was in for a rude awakening. My first move was to swap in Pupitar since it at least resists Max Flare. This ended up being a pretty good choice since it does about 20% because of Eviolite, but then it gets up the sun. But this is fine since it's unlikely to go for Max Flare again against Pupitar and after a Protect, G-Max Smite doesn't do that much damage. It does, however, confuse 100% of the time, but knowing that I'm going to get hit by a G-Max Smite again and not being able to stay in, I go ahead and swap in Aaron, who unfortunately takes a butt ton of damage, so after the Hatterini turns into its regular size, I go ahead and swap in Cory. Cory then is to take a Psychic, which he takes very uncomfortably, and after swapping around a bit, I realized that I was fighting a very uphill battle. Chat was helping me strategize, and I was swapping in between Lance and Aaron to dodge Mystical Fires and try and stall it out of PP by using Recover. Eventually, though, I survived a Mystical Fire on just one HP, and it's at this point I realized that I couldn't take another Psychic with Ferrothorn, so I had to let Aaron go. My plan was then to use Stetter with Iron Head, but in my calculations, it had too much health to be able to be taken out with one hit, so I had to swap in Cory first, go for a Wild Charge, and unfortunately sacrifice him too. These two noble sacrifices were not in vain, however, since Stetter can come in, take out the Hatterini with an Iron Head, giving me the win, but at a very steep cost. Losing a third of my team is something I've never excited about in a Nuzlocke, especially not if it's against Bead. However, I was super excited to see what my viewers had sent me, and my excitement certainly didn't go to waste as Brad sent me a Litten. On top of that, Brad went all the way and bred this thing with Intimidate, Parting Shot, and Fake Out. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is like the most overrepresented Pokemon in competitive right now, so a pretty good pickup. Unfortunately, I make a little bit of an oopsie as I level it up and use too many candies and almost get it past the level cap, which means I can only afford to evolve it into to Toracat and not all the way to Incineroar before the next fight. But with only five members on the team, we still have one more egg to hatch, and this one very fittingly hatches into a Rowlet. This does mean we have three grass types on the team, but who could say no to Decidueye, and it's honestly not that bad a thing since our next opponent is Nessa. You honestly want to use electric types instead of grass types for all our Pokemon except for Dreadnought, but that's not exactly a luxury I'm afforded here, so I go for Protect to dodge the first impression, but it goes for Swords Dance instead setting up to plus two. And while it would be much better to Encore it into First Impression, it's fine to Encore it into Sword Stance as well, swapping out into Ferrothorn. This is the part where I do Ferrothorn's thing and start setting up some curses. Unfortunately though, this is where Golisopod's Encore ends and a Shadow Claw does quite a bit of damage. I did however go for Curse this turn as well, which does pay off since the next Shadow Claw does a little bit less damage and I can take out the Golisopod with a Power Whip. The only issue with our plan here is that Lance is getting kind of low on health, so every other turn, I go for Protect to get as much leftovers recovery as possible. Then, since Seeking is the least threatening member of Ness's team, I take the time to set up as many curses as I need, and then sweep through her team with Power Whip. Teach her to mess with the best Pokemon from Generation 5. During the fight versus Nessa, Torcat did get to the level cap of 55, which does mean it evolves into Incineroar, but we do have to be a little bit careful with how we disperse EXP. The next fight is versus Alistair the Invoker, who starts the fight by normal summoning a Dusk Noir. And while Dusk Noir is a pretty threatening Pokemon, 
all we have to do is use Charm a few times, swap into Sidui, and set up a couple of Swords Dances, after which I can just annihilate his entire team with Shadow Snakes. Now that we only have one more Gym Leader to face in the Champion's Cup, I go ahead and get everyone to the level cap and evolve Pupitar into a Tyranitar. Now if you ask me, Pokemon sorely needs a hard mode built into the game, but what they should have done is just made it so that Raihan is a double battle for this second fight as well. I'm also kind of baffled at the stupidity of my strategy here. I wanted to set up Misty Surge so that he can't go for Yawn, but this just means I'm going to get hit by Lava Plume. And as I set up a Dragon Dance here, I can hear your face palming from the other side of the screen since this Torkoal obviously has Body Press. And by some miracle, Tyranitar actually manages to survive this on 14 HP, which I certainly don't deserve at all. Expecting it to go for Body Press again, I send in my Ghost Type Decidueye, but it just goes for Solar Beam, which is also fine. Having Tyranitar be rendered useless for the rest of the fight is certainly going to be damaging when we have to face Duraludon, but that's a bridge we'll cross later. But since we can't use Tyranitar versus Torkoal anymore either, we're going to have to use a more degenerate strategy. Every time we swap an Incineroar, we lower the attack of this Torkoal with Intimidate. We can then get some chip damage with Fake Out and finally swap out with Parting Shot to lower both of its attacking stats. The Torkoal then pretty much has to go for either Yawn or Body Press, both of which we can dodge by just pivoting out into either Decidueye or Weezing. And honestly, my personal opinion is that generally this is kind of a degenerate way to play Pokemon, but in Nuzlocke, this is kind of peak gameplay. Either way, after around 30 actual minutes of stalling this thing out of moves, eventually it could only hit me with Solar Beam. I even think it was out of Yawn PP at this point, but even if it still had some, it couldn't use it because of Misty Surge, so I'm free to set up as many Swords Dances as I want. From there, we can definitely take it out with a plus six Shadow Sneak at the health it had left after all those fake outs. We then have to deal with Turtonator, and here's the thing, we're faster than Turtonator no matter what, but I don't think Shadow Sneak KOs, and if it goes for Shell Trap, which it did right here, we definitely want to move to take it out to not take the damage, and so to make sure we get that one hit KO, I use Spirit Shackle instead. Next up is Flygon, which we're definitely not going to be outspeeding with that base 60 speed that Decidueye has, and we can't one hit KO with plus six Shadow Sneak, so I go ahead and swap out into Brad to get an Intimidate, as the Flygon just sets up a Sandstorm. I then use a Fake Out just to get a little bit of chip damage and swap out immediately into Lance since we're not going to be outspeeding with a parting shot. Lance then gets hit by an earthquake, but at minus one, it really isn't doing that much damage. And what can I say? From here, Ferrothorn did what Ferrothorn does best and used Protect every other turn to get as much leftover recovery as possible and set up its curses. From there, Flygon was an easy KO with Power Whip, and since Gudra just set up the rain, we can definitely take it out with a single Gyro Ball. Duraludon is his final Pokemon, and even though we don't have any great moves to hit this thing with, it's hitting itself with Iron Barbs pretty effectively, and at plus six defense, we're barely taking any damage, and finally, we take him out, finishing the Champion's Cup. We now have two major fights in the game left, and while I wasn't too worried about the first one, since all Rose uses is Steel types, and we have a Fire type that's one of the best Pokemon that's ever been made, yeah, you can kind of guess how that one went. Instead, I was a lot more worried about stumbling on the finish line, because even though our team looks awesome, every single one of these guys are weak to his Aegislash. Seriously, this thing's got coverage out the wazoo. And that's not to mention the rest of his stacked team. And so, after a ton of planning and strategizing, it was finally time to take on Champion Leon. And the very first problem that I was going to have to tackle was that pesky Aegislash. And I was kind of hoping that it would go for an attack here, since I can easily outspeed, but I do end up hitting the Destiny Bond as he goes for King Shield. The following turn, I then go for Protect, as the Aegislash goes for a Flash Cannon, which would most definitely KO if I didn't protect myself. I then go for a Destiny Bond again, expecting the Aegislash to take me out, and honestly, I could have gone for a Heat Wave here, but I really didn't want to rely on that 95% accuracy, so unfortunately, we have to let Weezing go. I know we're trading one for one here, but at least this gets the annoying Aegislash out of the way, which means we're going to face Dragapult, so I go ahead and send in Stetter. And this time, Tyranitar has given up on dancing for good, since I'm holding an Assault Vest to mitigate damage, and a single crunch is gonna be enough to take out the Dragapult. This baits in Haxorus, and since this thing has both Earthquake and Iron Tail, I really don't want to stay in, and I go ahead and swap into Lance, as an Earthquake does some pretty decent damage. To somewhat mitigate that, I go ahead and go for Protect the next turn to get two turns of Leftovers, and I get hit by another Earthquake, as I can then set 
up a curse to start taking less and less damage. While setting up, I continue to use Protect every other turn to maximize the health we have as we set up our stats. Once satisfied with my setup, an Earthquake hits me down to a nay 69 HP and a Gyro Ball is enough to one-shot the Haxorus. Next is Inteleon, and even though we have the tight matchup, I go for Protect to get as much health as possible because Dark Pulse could cause some shenanigans if we end up getting flinched. And unfortunately, as we proceed to the next turn, you'll note that that is exactly what happens. This amount of health, I really wasn't sure if it would be enough even to use another Protect here to get more leftovers, but as it hits another Dark Pulse, I do end up surviving on 12 HP, and I don't get flinched, which means a Power Whip takes out the Inteleon. Leon now has two Pokemon left, and his next one is Mr. Rhyme. I do end up going for Protect here just to get a bit more leftovers to hopefully survive a Freeze Dry the next turn, but alas, it isn't enough, taking out Lance once and for all. This at least gives me a free switch into Frog Champ, who's definitely weak to Ice, but since we can outspeed with a super effective Stab Spirit Shackle, Mr. Rhyme is out of the way, which means we only have to deal with his Charizard. But the battle is far from over, since this thing can easily power up its speed with Max Airstream and make it very difficult for us to deal with it. So I go for a Shadow Sneak just to get some chip damage, and luckily it does go for G-Max Wildfire instead of Airstream, taking out Frog Champ. I then send in Ryan, whose moveset is prepared for exactly this, going for a Priority Cotton Spore, lowering Charizard's speed to minus two as it gets back to minus one with a Max Airstream. I do have a Focus Sash on Ryan here, and he is unfortunately going to go down to the G-Max Wildfire burn damage, but I did this just in case he only used Max Airstream to give me at least two Cotton Spores to at least be able to outspeed with my next Pokemon. At this point, we only have two Pokemon left, and Brad's Intimidate is going to do absolutely nothing against this Charizard's solely special moveset. The Charizard does get back to neutral speed with another Max Airstream that Incineroar actually manages to survive, and I can hit it with a Thunder Punch for not that great damage. And while this means that Charizard is out of its Dynamax turns, it can still hit us with an Ancient Power that Brad actually manages to survive on 28 HP, after which I go for a Parting Shot, reducing Charizard's special attack and attack before swapping out into Stetter. Between the minus one from the Parting Shot and my Assault Vest, I'm pretty sure Tyranitar could handle a Solar Beam, but Charizard is left being a sitting duck recharging, as we can just take it out with a Rock Slide. And that's how I beat a Pokemon Shield Hardcore Egglock. And with only two Pokemon left, that was a pretty close call. And honestly, I had a blast with chat trying to take on this unique challenge live. So let me know if you guys like this strange version of a randomizer, and I kind of want to do another one in the future where you guys only get to send me garbage Pokemon, so let me know if that sounds fun. Also, I don't stream regularly at the moment, but when I do streams, I make sure to make a community post over on YouTube, so ring the bell here or follow me on Twitch to get notified whenever I do. But until then, and until we see each other next time, 